At the slender age of 21, Kevin Durant finished second in MVP voting on a league-best 30 points per game. Over the years, he improved his ball handling, playmaking, and defense, winning the MVP in 2014. But just how good was he in those areas? Should he have been an all-league defender? And was his combination of size, agility, and world-class outside shooting enough to make him the greatest scorer of all time? You are watching what greatness is all about. Where's Larry Bird in all this? Has it blocked by Elijah on? Michael Jordan <laughs> saves the day. This series tackles one question. Who was the best at his best? We start at the ABA merger and go through the best multi-year stretches, examining the legends who provided the most on-court impact. These are the greatest peaks. KD, what is it that you do better than anybody? And you don't have to be humble here. We're just, nah. just a, a small group of friends and people with cameras. Honestly, I think I score better than anybody. In Oklahoma City, Durant was a scoring animal, claiming four scoring titles in five seasons. The Slim Reaper was just the fourth player in league history with a dominant scoring stretch like that, joining Wilt Chamberlain, Michael Jordan, and the one and only Iceman. You figured it out yet? No, not that Iceman, but George Gervin, a six foot seven point machine who was all arms and legs too. Gervin had a soft, sweet stroke, lived in the mid-range in that era, and of course he could finger roll. He was also so long he could just shoot right over defenders, which made him a pre-three-point era prototype for Durant. KD was an upgrade in just about every area. He was even bigger, standing 6'9 and a half without shoes, and like ice he could work off screens and find little sweet spots to detonate from. But Durant could also launch from behind the arc, and 39% three-point shooting during these seasons juiced his scoring efficiency. You'll notice how many of these shots involve movement, because sliding around to find scoring pockets and then catching and shooting was a huge part of Durant's success. 59% of his outside shots were assisted, around average among high-volume long-range shooters. He wasn't a jitterbug without the ball, but he could throw off some defenders, flipping this cut back around the screen beautifully. And because he was a supersized wing with a 7-5 wingspan, he could drop these right over strong contests from big men. Yet he had enough agility in him to backdoor this action when he felt an overplay, and this takes nice feel to read a defender, and his size made these lobs easy to finish. Because he was such a large target, guards could throw over the top to him like this, and he was slithery enough to catch off a screen and attack all the way to the cup. So in addition to great shooting from the mid-range and deep, KD could put it on the deck and finish in traffic with those praying mantis arms. This dribble drive game was a huge part of his scoring prowess, because if teams tried to run him off the line, he was one dribble from a layup with the size to finish. Kevin could initiate these attacks, flying into a big man and finishing nicely here. But if that big man sagged off in the pick and roll, he could burn them with his pull-up three. This put defenses in a serious pickle because he had the long range precision of a modern guard. But if they overreacted to his shooting, he could blow by and finish among the trees at the rim. His ball handling and a little bit of shiftiness boosted this penetration game, but he also had some burst in his engines, covering a ton of ground in just a dribble or two. It looks like he's preparing to use this screen. This defender is worried about a pull-up three, so he crosses back over and accelerates downhill for free throws. By the way, putting KD on the line was a bad idea since he shot a little under 90% in those years, and he was able to get there with some regularity thanks to tricks like the rip-through move. He also would drive into some contact. There's a huge crossover, and he just plows into the help for the plus one. But Durant's rim finishing was more about his speed and long strides than strength or physicality. 
He builds up ahead of steam here, picks up his dribble at the free throw line, and sidesteps to create a little opening, and he's so long it's a drop in the bucket. That's usually some smothered chicken by Tim Duncan against a smaller player. Durant used these Euro-like steps to slip past defenders in space, and here Kawhi Leonard runs him off the line. Durant wisely attacks his front leg, and then look at all the ground he covers with a single stride. Big men were often worried about Durant's pull-up. It was a larger part of his attack than getting all the way to the hoop, so he could use a little hesitation to freeze them and then gallop home with those long legs. He didn't get to the basket as often as someone like LeBron did, but when he did, Durant was extremely efficient, finishing with the 14th best field goal percentage at the rim since 2001. Like LeBron, KD was a weapon in transition. Sometimes he'd turn up the speed and pressure backpedaling opponents, and he could also run to the three-point line and drop daggers from there as a finisher. These skills work together. This defender jumps to the three-point line, but Durant just floors it for the flush. And the interplay between long-range shooting and hard drives like this made him an elite transition scorer during these seasons. He also liked to walk into threes in semi-transition. There's that range again. And between his long arms and a little elevation, his release point on these was nearly unblockable. Little hops and hesitation moves force defenders to worry about his drive, and that creates enough airspace to stroke these pull-ups over the outstretched arms of the longest defenders in the game. Even more so than Gervin before him, Durant's ability to just rise up over players and rain jumpers on their head gave him access to mid-range shots almost on demand. Of course, this is the least efficient of his scoring zones, but by 2016, he improved his mid-range accuracy to about 49%, a jump of over four percentage points from his earlier seasons when he won MVP, and enough to regularly land him at or near the top of the league from this distance. However, as a three-point shooter, KD was far more accurate in catch-and-shoot situations than off of these pull-ups. From 2014 to 18, he was a scorching 43% on catch-and-shoot attempts, according to Second Spectrum's optical tracking, but he was just under 35% on his pull-ups, so he wasn't quite as lethal on these self-generated attempts. He could certainly generate shots with his back to the basket, again using his size to just rise up over defenders, while comfortably working out of the mid-post area to find little fadeaways or turnarounds like this. His post-game included a mini Dirk Nowitzki impression, occasionally flashing that ridiculous one-legged fallaway like the big German himself. Durant's height allowed him to take smaller players to the block. Undersized guards like this offered little resistance that close to the hoop, but stick bigger forwards on him and he could torture them by running around screens. Bigger players aren't used to chasing world-class outside shooters, and Kevin was most comfortable catching and shooting without a dribble like this. Durantula's ability to score at three levels, both on and off the ball, made him arguably the greatest regular season scorer we've ever seen. In the playoffs, however, his effectiveness fell back to earth just a bit, which still made him one of the great scorers in league history. Like all players, his statistics were influenced by his teammates and his opponents. Without a teammate to break down defenses and set him up for easier looks, Durant's numbers as the lone offensive focal point look quite different than when he plays next to another star. From 2014 to 18, with Russell Westbrook or Steph Curry on the court next to him, KD's scoring efficiency looks really good compared to other high-volume scorers. But without those star guards occupying defensive attention, he took a sizable dip in efficiency because he had to create more of his own offense. There was a significant increase in his unassisted field goals in those situations. Now, thinking basketball regulars, know that carrying an offense as a lone star isn't the be-all, end-all. There's arguably more value in creating scoring next to other high-end talent. 
Still, both roles are relevant, especially since so much of Kevin Durant's impact is rooted in his scoring game and the opportunities that scoring game helped him create for his teammates. Another vicious dunking last night. Here's what we know. Suspect is 6'9", wiry, short hair, nice smile. Wiry. In 2016, the Thunder took a 73-win Warriors team to the brink before New York City tourist Clay Thompson went into NBA jam mode in Game 6 and helped Golden State survive in a classic seven-game series. That was one of Durant's bumpier series during his prime, largely because the Warriors overloaded his side while ignoring his weaker shooting teammates. Sliding an extra defender, smack into KD's driving lane, allowed for greater ball pressure and pushed him into difficult contested jumpers. This made it harder to attack the rim, and a decent decline in shooting percentages at the hoop was one reason why Durant's playoff scoring lagged behind his regular season output. With both outside defenders hugged in and up into Durant's driving gaps, Clay plays him tightly, and Durant fumbles it, which kills a ton of clock and leads to a desperate attempt. Andre Robertson's open because he's a 28% shooter from the corner. When KD played in Golden State, defenses couldn't pack the paint on him because of the Splash Brothers' threat to shoot, so scoring became easier for him. There's an entire video on this channel about these extreme differences if you're interested. For instance, the Warriors just ignore Serge Ibaka on this play to drop a defender into the lane, and that leads to a ball-handling turnover from Kevin. Despite some of these slick crossovers that helped him penetrate or pull up, he had his share of fumbles and flubs as such a tall ball handler. Dribbling through a sea of defenders might work for Leo Messi, but in basketball, passing is the natural counter. We've seen this from other modern wings in this series, where soft doubles are attacked with timely and accurate skip passes. Durant could throw these passes at this point in his career, although it could take him a beat to recognize one of these. This is a bit of a floater, which makes the first closeout easier, but still leads to a good shot. Again, notice he gathers himself first, but then flicks a quick pass, the kind that makes it harder to close out to, and it ends up in a three ball in the corner pocket. KD did have some diversity on his releases, and passing off the bounce with his right hand like that exploited gaps. Defenders can't anticipate the pass, making slingshots like this much harder to react to. Here's a great delivery out of pick and roll, blending a dribble into a skip pass, and again, throwing early provides more time for any shooter who was good enough to close out to, and Durant's handle and some passing flexibility let him play make out of these pick and roll actions. Remember, defenses still had to focus on him as a pull-up weapon off of screens, and he could use that threat to find pass increases, here going to the hesitation and then passing after freezing the defender. And he could make little pocket passes like this too with his rolling big man, although this particular pass was actually a thorn in his side, leading to plenty of batted balls and turnovers. These passes can't just be mindlessly flicked into empty space, and KD had lackadaisical moments as a distributor, throwing deliberate or even telegraphed passes. Here's one where he fires it off a leg initially, but on the recovery comes back to it with a little drop off, and these were some of his better passes, able to punish helping defenders when he got downhill. I like that he threw some of these laydowns early, that's a pretty quick reaction to nearly set up a dunk, and it requires solid vision to identify openings like this as they begin to emerge. He's still not someone I'd call a natural playmaker though, he was thinking score first, here instinctively dribbling before spotting the wide open layup. This meant he wasn't a really strong off-ball passer, in part because he was looking to catch and score on these. He could make this pass off a curl, but it wasn't a consistent find for him. On this one, he just misses a wide open look under the rim, 
and this looks like one of those problematic ball handling situations where he wasn't smooth picking up his dribble. This one's a more basic pick and roll attack, right-handed dribble into tons of space, under control, and he gets below the free throw line for a gorgeous little drop off. However, he didn't always take that extra dribble. That's a nice little pocket pass, but if KD attacks the gap, it gets his roll man a step deeper and potentially opens up the corner pass. We saw LeBron James regularly take that dribble last episode, whereas Durant was often quick to pick it up near traffic or not always attack these gaps. This is a two-on-one with the roll man, but even though the defender starts retreating, he pulls up for a tricky jumper instead of applying more pressure. In transition, he didn't need to get deep into the paint because his speed and pull-up shooting provided enough pressure to draw extra defensive attention. And when he did push, having his head up and more space made these more comfortable hookups for him. Speaking of transition, he played with a one-man fast break in Westbrook, who carved up defenses himself with violent bursts of speed. That Thunder team was really a two-man operation with role players flanking them in support, and Westbrook had some chemistry setting up Durant as part of his off-ball game. KD couldn't create for his teammates like Westbrook, but estimates of his shot creation land him at about 85% of Kobe Bryant's peak from episode 10, making him a grade A offensive centerpiece. Durant might not have been ideal in a heliocentric role as a lone offensive creator, but his off-ball game added tons of value next to other competent playmakers. KD could space the floor for his teammates, especially as a power forward, and his shooting provided some gravity that made things easier for other players on offense. This is a highly scalable attack, able to plug in next to other superstars without the ball and add value as a secondary playmaker. Between his elite scoring, off-ball shooting, and solid ability to create for others, Durant's been part of some seriously high-end offenses, first in OKC, in spite of some of their spacing issues, and then as a key piece in Golden State, where he joined an incredible attack and made them even better. On defense, Durant's versatility played right into the Warriors' switching scheme. This allowed them to play the vaunted Hamptons 5 lineup, with KD adding an element of rim protection to a smaller group. That expansive 7'5 wingspan gave him some rim protecting chops, and as a small forward, he was a high-end shot blocker. Take this play, where he's actually late to rotate and help, but once he arrives, he can defend a big right at the rim. So as a wing on the court, he was an additional paint defender who could challenge high-value shots like this, and when he played the four, he was still able to plug up the back line with all that length. And of course, he could switch multiple positions. He starts out guarding Draymond Green, but picks up Clay out of this scrum, and then slides up and defends the goal with those pterodactyl wings. Here's a clutch play where Golden State switched to ball screen because good luck attacking Draymond Green. So that leaves Thompson on a bigger skilled post player, and with Draymond on the perimeter, Durant can still come over and defend it. This kind of length and versatility is perfect for these spaced out switching defenses that became more popular during these seasons. Now, despite Durant's size, he wasn't a defensive big man by nature, and that meant he wasn't that physical down low and didn't take up space in traffic or throw his body onto powerful players. He also wasn't comfortable planting himself in driving lanes and playing goalkeeper, and would often contest shots from deeper under the basket. He didn't have the best timing as a shot blocker. He jumps way before the shooter here, and it's a foul. This held him back a little bit as a shot blocker, but the more important issue was not always being in position to defend some of these shots. Kevin could be a bit spacey at times. You see him check the corner, then stare right at this cut as it unfolds, yet he doesn't react until the ball almost arrives. 
If he moved earlier, he's not going to be buried under the rim, or there might not be a pass at all. Some of these plays were classic cases of ball watching while a cutter flew by, and he could have momentary lapses, assuming this was going to be a handoff, and there's that mistimed jump on the recovery. Vision could also be an issue too. There were moments where he struggled to locate the basketball, and I'm not sure he knew a pass was made when he was called to switch onto the shooter. Chasing players off ball like this occupied some of those limited attentional resources, and his size made navigating screens a bit tricky, especially in an era where offensive linemen, uh, uh, I mean screeners, can move pretty liberally. On this one, he's preparing for one screen, but it's reversed and without tight cornering skills, Durant takes a wide path back to the shooter, so it's a clean look. When he was guarding the dribbler directly, he could still get hung up on ball screens like this, but he could also fight through some of these screens, battling the pick while keeping ball handlers within that giant reach of his. Switching schemes were ideal for KD, precisely because he had some success against a variety of players on the perimeter. The emphasis here is on some, because he could author really effective possessions against elite wing players when all of his lateral movements synced up with the ball handler, or when he didn't have to react to sudden stop and go moves, and then that length could work wonders. Against shiftier opponents, he was vulnerable to sudden changes in direction, it's a lot for him to snap his hips around to track Curry here, and in general he didn't have great acceleration from a standstill when he was in a defensive stance like this. Compare that to a more straight line attack with KD swiveling his hips at an angle to stay with the drive, and that's a nice defensive stand. Here's another one against a Curry pullback, and because Durant can decelerate well, his length just eats this up good post scorers with some muscle could find success against him near the bucket, but he was rarely a mismatch when checking bigs down on the block since he was often just as tall as them, and his capacity to mix perimeter responsibilities with big man responsibilities, like rotating back to the paint after guarding a pick and roll, is a nice value add in any flexible switching scheme the kind that tends to have more value throughout the gauntlet of the postseason. His impact metrics on defense are a bit up and down, but on average they see him as a small positive, and I think that's in the right ballpark, which puts his overall numbers in the vicinity of some of the other greats in this series. His numbers were actually better in Golden State, swapping in his injured 2019 playoffs, in place of his final run in OKC, where he was dragged down by some poor shooting. Some of that shooting might have been bad luck, but some of it was being a primary focal point that defenses could load up on. In Golden State, he was able to blend his on-ball scoring with his considerable off-ball talents in a more ideal, hybridized role that didn't strain his self-generated scoring or ask too much of his playmaking. This hybrid package helped him generate impressive offenses next to a ball-dominant player like Russell Westbrook and then turn a great offense into the best one ever in Golden State. So while he wasn't a classic offensive quarterback, his incredible shooting and overall scoring package, along with his versatile, positive defense, combined to give Kevin Durant one of the greatest peaks in NBA history. For more historical content and to support this channel, head over to patreon.com slash thinkingbasketball and check out Thinking Basketball, the book on Amazon. That goes deeper on a number of ideas explored in this series. There are also longer discussions on many of these players on the Thinking Basketball podcast. And if you're curious about stats from this video, there's an entire stat series on this channel. Otherwise, thanks so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed this one and that wherever you are, you're having a great day. Green and Barnes were right there. Here comes Curry. Curry for three. Bang!